learning can come in so many shapes, and so many different forms. Seat at the Table is a co-production with our friends at Verso Studios here at the Westport Library. It's not membership driven. It's not pay to play. There's no other organization like it in our culture. On this episode of A Seat at the Table, we speak with Bill Harmer, Executive Director of the Westport Library. Lori, what did we learn? We learned that this library is fun and that it's going to be really fun in the years to come. And then under the direction of Bill Harmer, this is going to be much bigger than books. So tune in, enjoy the podcast. We'll see you in a bit. So we're here with Bill Harmer, Executive Director of the Westport Library. It's kind of exciting what's happening here at the library uh, here in Westport and the major renovation and, and just sort of taking libraries to a whole new standard. And, and for someone like myself who hasn't spent much time in library uh, libraries in the past, um, I find myself here a few times a week now. So I thank you for that. Part of like all this innovation and this this amazing stuff we're doing is the is uh, there's a lot to deliver on. Right. And, and we, we've got a, we're dealing with a, we're dealing with literally a startup budget. Mm -hmm. So it's, I don't have a, a, like a wealth of, I've got one guy to manage my studios right now. Right. And I don't know how we're going to execute, you know, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be, it's going to be a challenge. You're going to take people. But it's funny because I don't know that that's the perception. I mean, we talked a little bit about this before this, just that there is this perception there it's public knowledge what the library costs to do so everybody thinks okay there's been almost 20 million dollars put in the library so where's where does all that go but the reality of it is that's to build a modern facility state of the art facility that has 12 year olds hanging out here being coaches and volunteering and helping and being invigorated right and 20 million goes quickly in that regard so it sounds like programming something that you're yeah well the the that budget was to build the facility. Right, it, the wasn't infrastructure. To, it wasn't to manage it going forward. But anyway, we got off track. Let's, 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 let's dig in. Let's well, dive well, but that's, in. that's yep. part of it. Is I that you, that's really part of it. Yeah. The part of it mm-hmm. that you're, you need the community in order to make all this, all these dreams come true. And we certainly right. need the community to make the Bill Tavy, Lori Cocker and a seat at the table podcast happen. Absolutely. Yeah. As a, <laughs> as a business owner, which is very similar mm-hmm. as an entrepreneur and a business owner and similar to what you're dealing with. I, I spend a lot of money or I raise, I don't spend the money, but I raise a lot of money building restaurants um, it never seems like enough, but it's always too much. And then we open the doors and we try to think to ourselves, okay, now what? Like how to, where's the money to put in the inventory or the staffing or a year later, we're still trying to figure out sort of the X's and O's of the game. And, you know, do we have the right staff? Do we have the right people? Is the concept right? So you're in that phase now. So I completely yeah. understand it. I've yeah. been through this a lot. Um, and I understand the excitement and the build up that comes when you're creating something new and exciting. Right. And then the reality when it opens and you're saying, Oh shit, now I got to work. Right. I feel like the the Robert Redford character in the candidate, he gets elected to (laughs) office and then he he looks at his people and he has that. Oh shit. Right. Like, Oh my God. Now what? (laughs) Now what? Right. Now we have to actually run this really cool library. Right. The, um, um, and I, I do think that the, the challenges in the corporate world versus the nonprofit world, they're different challenges. I mean, they're similar but but different too mm-hmm. because um you know he, you know in, in this scenario everyone's your boss right everyone and everyone feels entitled to be able to go straight uh you know you know to the top right and yep. and i feel an obligation as the face of the library to make time to to meet with you know my constituents but the reality is, that, you know, that might not be the best business practice right now. And I need to be focused on uh, on, on a much higher uh, level strategically. On the right, overarching right plan. Right. I, I mean, mean oh, I hear you. I hear that. And I think everyone is important. I think you're challenged in that space. You're challenged in that space in restaurants. But I, I, I do agree in a nonprofit sector. Towns own you, communities own you, every developer owns you, every person who don- donates money owns you. Yeah. And you do feel this pull. But... And I, you're going to get in your rhythm. I mean, you're, you're brilliant. So you're going to get in your rhythm to be able to find those boundaries, but you probably don't have many boundaries right now would be my guess. Right. Yeah. Everybody wants the <laughs> Bill Harmer, which is right. one of the reasons we really wanted to do this podcast is because I think getting to know who you really are, we've both have had the opportunity to have a drink with you outside of here and see the fun side of you and the, you know, this, the sparkle that's in your eye and you're, you're, you're contagious truthfully of like your passion and your excitement 
and and you've drawn us in. I mean, yeah, we, you sold me. Here yeah. I am. No, we're so I'm spending I'm time in the library. I know I've been touting on libraries for years. It feels like whatever, right, whatever. Right. And now he, now yeah. he's on board. This is so, my place yeah, now. Yeah. Exactly. Right. He's going to be reading books before long too. Yeah. And I think that, you Not know, that you that, don't read. Yeah. No, I don't. The, the suggestion <laughs> is I read everything on the internet. Uh, the suggestion is, you know, you do need to set boundaries and it's, again, it's what I've done. You know, I've, I've set up with my beloved investors that they're silent investors and they're quiet. It's very different. And I, I'm working with Lori closely with the farmer's market. She deals with the same thing. And I'm, I'm blown away sometimes by the FaceTime spent, you know, just being out front and, and like Lori had said, contagious, but also, um, you know, just transparent and available to people is overwhelming at times. So I could only imagine what you're going through now, but you set those boundaries, you move forward, you, you take care of what you need to take care of now. And then you get to the point of what I think is going to excite you, which is programming and setting a new tone for what people see as a library. And, and yeah. I know you, you, you have it, it's there and it'll happen. And for some reason you probably need 30 hours a day right now. And that just doesn't, you know, yeah, doesn't you need to exist. take care of yourself. You need to stay healthy. Yeah. Um, but you got a good team of people around you. So I think you guys are going to do it. Yeah. And I mean, the good news is we're, we're already seeing the returns. I, the, I, I've been watching the, our numbers in terms of the numbers of people coming through our door every day. And we're, you know, we're hitting 2000 people through our door a day right now, wow. which is Insane. almost double. Wow. Can I put a restaurant in here? <laughs> uh, I, I actually have an idea. And a concept He's been for saying that. that about the market too. <laughs> oh, how, wow. about a, how about a restaurant on the roof of this building? Yes. Brilliant. Like, we could, put a bar. could you imagine yeah. the, um, the view See? from up there? Yes. This is, why we, need right? to, this is a, why we need to find more time vision, for Bill. That's to do vision program. part two. Vision right, part two, farm to table and no plastic. Right. Yeah. Rooftop bar. Right. I'm in. Yeah, you got it. my support. Yeah, well, Bill Tavey so. just put his name on that one. <laughs> right. So, so I, I want to go. You, yeah. How do you become a librarian? Go back to that. How did you? How do you become a librarian? What What drew you to this? Because you know, in my mind, again, the guy that doesn't spend more hadn't spent much time in libraries wasn't a great student. So typically, I get kicked out of library because I make a lot of noise. But I have this image of an an older woman with like stockings on. You're not that person. So you know, what drew you to be a librarian? What does that mean to you? How did you get into this? Well, I, you know, I, it sounds like a cliche, but, you know, as a young person, it was probably the attraction to books, right? Even though at, libraries are still very much still about that, um, you know, as a young person who just had a thirst for knowledge, I was passionate about books and music. And so you ask the question, how does one become a librarian? Right. Well, you have to get a, a degree. Uh, it's amazing how many People think that, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't require an advanced degree. It sure, does. Right. It's oh, yeah. a graduate level degree. So I have a master's degree in library and information science. My company uh, paid for me to go back and get that degree. I got the thing. So I started uh, volunteering at the uh, public library next door to our corporate headquarters and was instantly hooked. And what hooked me was um, that you never know who's going to walk through your door uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, hourly, uh, hour to hour, and how you can have an impact in someone's life. It might be as, as simple as putting the right book in, in the right hands at the right time, sure. mm -hmm. or it might be that um, uh, helping people out with very complex, um, you know, things that are happening in their life. It could be a health-related issue where they just got a terrible, life-changing diagnosis, and they're confused and they don't know how to communicate to their doctor. They don't know how to talk to their family about it. And, and it's, uh, it is helping them navigate through that process. Um, the, uh, it, it just, you just never know what's going to happen because you don't know who's going to walk through your door. So I think that ability to connect with people and hour to hour, day to day, make a difference in somebody's life was meaningful, uh, than sitting in a cubicle, uh, editing, um, textbooks that quite frankly, I didn't really care about too right. much. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, when you see that, I mean, this is the essence of community here. I think we just talked about the 12 year old we ran into, but we just spent 15 minutes with a 12 year old who is incredibly confident here and is talking about being a coach with, you know, he's 3d printing and is telling us all about it and running off words and acronyms that both of us had no clue who he's talking about, but he was passionate and it was just a community. And in what other space do you walk into a building where two random adults walk up and sit down with a 12 year old and have a conversation? Right. 
It and just he, isn't open. He, it's a diffuser. Right, he is a master at his field. He was just so genuinely interested in teaching us. And again, you don't, that experience doesn't exist in many other places here in town just because, and, and you know, what's interesting to me again, uh, and I'll say the same thing, someone that did, never utilized this amenity, uh, when I first met you, what I realized was, uh, you know, this guy could kind of change the game for me a little bit. I saw a lot of sort of my silly passion in you and this, you know, this sort of goofiness of, hey, we could change the world. And you know what, just give me people and give me contact and I could, I could, I could help them. And that's, you know, that's what I do with restaurants. That's what Lori does with the farmer's market. We spend a lot of time talking about this. We have interaction and contact with people and we can make a change. And you did that here. Uh, and obviously, though, what I find so interesting and maybe I'm wrong and Lori could might be able to to check me on this, but it seems to me you had a different view of what a, or your approach to being a librarian was much different than I think than a lot of people. Uh, your experiences early on as a librarian, you know, being a, a teen librarian and, you know, sort of bringing in the sort of, you know, when you were talking to kids and trying to do uh, sort of, you know, the, like the silly foods, the, yeah. the, you know, the, the using bugs. bug life. Yeah, yeah, bugs right. uh, these are different approaches and just, you know, really sort of attracting to different groups of people. And that's what I'm so interested about. You know, you, you looked at this differently, don't you think? Oh, it's so interesting that you were talking about changing the world. Uh, and, and maybe that was the geek in me in high school. I, I, I was in, I, I wanted to be, uh, I had big ambitions. Uh, I wanted to be if someone that was going to make a difference and and, and change uh, uh, the world. Yeah, me too. Uh, I, and I think it was books and music that it that ins that brought that out in me. Uh, the only problem is uh, I can't carry a tune, and I'm not a very talented writer. So <laughs> I needed to find something else for uh, uh, for uh, you know uh, uh, as a creative outlet. Mm -hmm. And that is what's been so uh, unbelievably. Uh, pleasantly surprising about this profession is how much room there is for creativity. Um, and, uh, and, and probably, I, I think the fact that I came to this work after having spent 10 years in the corporate world probably helped me a little bit because uh, I, I could look at things a little bit differently. And, uh, and I'm just speaking for myself here um, and, and, and try to, you know, Imagine things a little bit different. Looking at as a as a library as a, as a blank canvas. Right. Um, yes, it has books and and uh, um, and and, um, and we're in the business of providing information and resources and all that. But there's there were a lot of other opportunities, and uh, and and so far nobody has told me no. Yeah, which is great. And you said before, you know, you take advantage of having people walk in the door looking for information. And you can offer that information to them. And that's a powerful tool. You right, can also make it right. fun. I mean, I right. today when I went to meet with Bill before this, one of my favorite things is your eyes lit up so much. I'm talking about Bill, by the way, lit up so much when he was talking about the other day, y'all were in here doing this event for the Arts Collective. And you, you walked out and you were playing Rogue One. And he was like, this is the coolest thing. And that you had this spark. Again, that spark, that ingenuity to say, what can I do to shake it up, to make people think differently of this library? And it seems like you've been doing that, as Bill just touched yeah. on, you're doing it along the way. So I think where you're, I don't know, maybe you're wrong, maybe I'm wrong, but are you getting to the point that like, did you kind of always have this vision or is this vision building as you're going? Oh, I think it's organic. Don't you find yeah. that too? Uh, Absolutely. In, in your work? Yeah, if you have an open mind, if you're a creative person and you keep your mind open, uh, it's endless possibility. And every day I try to get better. And I'd assume you're probably doing the same thing right now. Yes. And, uh, and I think if you can be open to, um, uh, first and foremost, what is the mission of the library? If you could look at it from a really, uh, 36,000 foot perspective, you know, we're in the learning education, um, you know, business. Well, that's pretty broad. What makes it even dreams. more special is it's forget about, you know, you're absolutely right in saying you could uh, emphasize a passion, but you have the opportunity here to actually show people passions they not even they don't even know that they have. And that's what I find so interesting is you have state of the art, top of the line equipment. Uh, we're sitting in a room right now taping a podcast, which if you asked me a year ago, what I'd be doing this, like, who would know? But right. we're sitting here. If I could tell you what this room is like that we're sitting in, it's amazing. And yeah. here we are, you know, in, in Westport, in a town that we're all familiar with. What I find so interesting is uh, you said before this sort of, you know, no pay to play, all inclusive, uh, you know, there's been a culture shift to 
you know, sort of uh, WeWork and Soho House and Noya House and all these different sort of like pay to play clubs, um, co-working spaces, you know, and and that really has been a, a, a sort of a big change in our culture and how people are going to do their work and how they're going to socialize. But you're offering those amenities here in the library uh, at at no cost to people. And that's what I find to be really great. And that's what's going to create community. That's and that's where the inclusiveness comes in. That's where the inclusiveness. Yeah. And right. it, it, uh, it doesn't matter what your political background is or how much money you bank you make or what kind of car you drive or, um, the, that inclusiveness is important. And those, those spaces are drying up in our culture. Right. They right. are. And right. I think that that's why that authenticity of a library, of a farmer's market, of a good, it, people are craving authentic connections with human beings. And the more they get it, the more they're drawn to it. And you're developing it. When, when do you think that this this shift happened with libraries where we went from, I mean, you know, hands grace to my grandmothers, but you know, the curly haired old ladies that were always saying shh in the library and had their little stockings on, you know, when did it shift to this to now you've got this handsome dapper guy that's always in a good suit, fun people that are here, you know, I mean, you've got a great young endless staff, possibilities. endless possibilities, music playing. When did it shift? I think it might be a little bit challenging to pinpoint that. Um, it, I probably the is that it now? Is it well, I think that now? movement probably started. <laughs> Take the credit. Take the credit. Take the Is credit and run. <laughs> I, I, one thing that I always hear people joke about at, say, cocktail parties is uh, the, they'll joke about the card catalog, for example. Yep. And and so when I when I read into that, what they're really saying is that technology has changed. Sure. And you could look at that a couple of different ways. Mostly, when I encounter a, a, a question like that, there's usually something cynical behind it. Which they're, what they're really trying to say is, "What? Why do we even need libraries?" Um, um, and right, so because I think, you have the information, you could go online, read right. any book you want in your Kindle, access any. Exactly. So I think that's where it started to change is in probably in the early '90s, where um, you know where you know libraries start you know started to gear up in terms of the technology and the internet and the computers, there was this fear that, that libraries were going to be, re, were going to become extinct, that, that they, they were just, uh, that technology would make libraries irrelevant. And of course, we've discovered that it's been anything but that. Okay. The, one of the smartest things that Bill Gates ever did that nobody ever talks about is the fact he made sure that he put his computers in the nation's libraries. Okay. Um, the, now, you could argue that he did that for philanthropic reasons, sure. but you could also argue that he saw something there uh, and understood something that was basic about human nature, which is the thing we were talking about, which is that human beings have a need to be around other human beings. The, um, uh, our, computer, uh, our computers the, that we have uh, available for the public, they're full every day. We have this new laptop vending machine where you can, you can check out a, a, a laptop. You know, people are checking those out all the time. So it isn't technology. It's, uh, it's, it, it, it's about creating spaces that are going to bring people uh, together. I can't remember that statistic, but I actually ran this by you. But I, and So don't hold me to the numbers, but it, it's like one in eight people, all libraries, their, their computers, their public computers are used... 800 times more, whatever the number is, but it was like this prolific number of usage for libraries throughout the country of people who did not have access to internet right. and who did not have right. access to computers were then able to use it at public libraries. And we were doing this research before we interviewed you the last time. And it was amazing of how the the numbers were relating back to inner cities or people of disadvantage and how that they were able to use the library computers to get jobs. Changes. It, change. It's a game changer. It's an, a game changer. game changer. Yeah. So you're a change agent. Our you know, libraries are change agents. Yeah, we use right. that term a lot. Um, and you see it, you know, we're, we, we go back to the 12 year old boy. We just had a conversation with, you were giving him an opportunity to, to study, learn, educate, teach, but probably well before uh, that opportunity would be given to him, which is typically either in high school or college. He's doing that at a much younger age because now he has the technology in front of him to work with it, learn, 
Uh, these are, and you're and and maybe not in the case here in Westport, but I'm sure you have people that come from out of town. And like Lori said, you know, not every community has the ability to work on Apple computers and Mac computers. So, uh, and you're offering them to people. Well, in, in the case of that, of the 12 year old kid, not only are we saying all that, but we're also saying to him that, um, that he has a level of authority and right. trust. That's yes, right. We're saying that, that you're, you have some expertise here that is valuable and we trust you in your uh, in, in your understanding of that knowledge and expertise to be able to share that with others. So it's uh, it, it, it's we've placed a lot of responsibility on that uh, kid's shoulders, uh, but we're saying that we trust uh, and that you have the knowledge and the expertise to be able to, sh- to share that with others. And that's a really empowering um, Extremely empowering um, thing to do for, like for a young person. Get, right. Well, and thinking right. about, I mean, we're both parents of teenage boys and especially boys are struggle with self-worth. I mean, that's like, a, and girls, I'm going to don't mean to be sexist here, yep. but they all do. And you, again, yeah, you've created a space that how amazing that teenagers are coming in here and finding a place to find their self-worth and find a place to connect over something. And you are empowering them. And we need to find more ways to do that with teenagers in general of giving them we all grew up in a different environment. They're growing up in a new environment and, and maybe the library is a place they find more of that. Yeah. It'd be nice. Cause if not, it's, it's access and sociability is all right. on social media, right. well, chat rooms and, and, yeah. and, 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 and right. yeah. form of technology. So if we could get them all to kind of sit here and, and teach and educate and learn, uh, I think you're, you're going to be way ahead of the game. I, I think what's really important, Bill is, is, you know, you were saying before you're in this kind of like now the honeymoon phase, right? Is the excitement of opening a library is everyone's excited about it, right? You're excited. You you did your job. You got the doors open and I know how hard it was and how hard everybody worked. And you're going to go through that sort of the early phases of just kind of tweaking and finding time to push forward. But I think what's most important now is, is really sitting back and appreciating first. And I do this with my restaurants you know, I'll go home at night when, when we open a restaurant and the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever it may be, but I go home at night and if I could just sit back and kind of smile about a few good things that happened through the day, it gets me going the next day and it, the job just doesn't seem to be uh, so terrible anymore. So, you know, I, I would advise that you learn to appreciate this because this is an amazing place and, you know, the pressures of the day to day are probably uh, extreme, but you're making a big difference right now and, and I appreciate it. What is, you know, is there a few things, we have a couple minutes left, there are a few things you're excited about that are coming up in the library. I know we have a few panel discussions coming up, a few talks, anything you want to talk about that people could look forward to? Sure. Well, I think first and foremost is uh, everyone is listening to this podcast right now, but our studio spaces aren't uh, open to the public just yet. So that's certainly one thing I'm very excited about is we're probably a month away where we're going to be able to invite the public in to use these spaces. So that that's a game changer because there isn't another public library that I'm aware of that has a facility um, uh, quite like this with this, the, the technology that we're providing in these three state of the art studios that uh, we've provided. It's just, we've got to get all those protocols and rules and policies and all that, you know, good stuff in place blah, that blah, people blah, don't blah see stuff. behind yeah. the yeah. scenes <laughs> before we're ready yeah. for blah, blah, blah. people to come in and create their <laughs> video game or record some music or uh, shoot a television commercial, do a professional photo shoot. All that's about a month away. And, and I know that the public is, is really chomping at the bit uh, to come in and start doing that stuff. I can't wait uh, to, uh, to start rolling that out to see how people uh, react to that. Now what's going to happen when we start programming it? What's going to happen when we, you know, do these killer events on Friday and Saturday nights in there, when we do our first uh, rock and roll band, our first live music event, our first stand-up comedy event, um, uh, whatever it happens to be, the, uh, the we still podcast. have to test those waters yet. Our first live podcast. Live podcast. The, what happens when we start getting podcasts like this out in the iTunes universe. And then, uh, and then who's the next one after that. And, uh, all of those things are going to, I think, start to compile and build on top, uh, on top of each other. And, uh, and, and we'll see now, hopefully see the mo- momentum build there. It's like um, your little rubber right. band wheel. You start a yeah, ball, you ball, start right. as a kid yeah. and you're kind of going and going all of a sudden you're like, wow, this is amazing. Right. Yeah. I think we could yeah. all agree the town of Westport desperately needed, um, this, I'm looking forward to concerts and maybe comedy acts and panel discussions and just 
intelligent nights of people getting together and talking about things that are passionate to a group of people. And it's not just about entertainment. I don't want to make it right. about that because it's not. I, I just think we need we need both. We, yeah. we need to ever, right? create opportunities for um, um, people to you know be able to stay right here in Westport and 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 uh, and, and and come to for a great event at the library. And then the next day they're here for, you know, a great author event or an exciting workshop or a community conversation about something that's topical and important to the community. Or maybe, maybe if with, any, with any luck next year, we'll get one of the presidential candidates to come and do, a, a, you know, a, a talk here with the community. Those are all within the realm of possibility and they're all very plausible that's what's that's what's excited it you, you you've got all you've got all of that in play here it's an educational opportunity it's an op, uh, you know there's opportunities to uh, to come to be entertained it, everything a lot of it's the essence of community here. i do have a question that i have got to ask what book are you reading uh, I'm reading a book called uh, Long Division. It's uh, uh, oh God. Uh, K- <laughs> Me too. Uh, K- Kesey, Kesey Lehman is the author's name. Um, Bill and I laughed in the, the back. Yeah. The, um, it's on my nightstand, uh, and I'm just just getting started on it, but it was some, someone recommended it to me. It's a um, um, young writer um, uh, from the South. I like Southern writers, so I'm, I'm looking oh, forward I to, love that. Uh, to reading Southern this. Southern girl. Um, but I do have to mention something about uh, the teens. I have never seen this many young adults uh, in the library in my four years here. You know what? It's just a cool space. I so mean, cool. it is a cool space, and there's a lot of um, opportunities here for them. There's we, we didn't design a space and say, oh, yeah, you teenagers, you go over there and let the rest of us, uh, you know, um, we'll, we'll, we get the rest of the space. Who no, is the architect? The whole library space? is is their space. Who is the architect? Uh, the architect's name is uh, Henry Meyerberg, and uh, he's quite the visionary. He he's designed libraries job. all, Open, all airy, over the globe. Welcoming. That's who you met. Right. Opening day with Nancy. Great. Remember okay. who knocked yes, on the door? You're absolutely That's right. That's who he yeah. came in and right. introduced him. Um, yeah, well, he, he nailed it. I know... Um, the library will be looking for is now or will be looking for interns. Definitely looking for interns. We're looking for interns who want to gain experience in our makerspace in our studios. The, you know what's so amazing about the makerspace model is that uh, we have taught young people how to use these skills. Once they've adapted those skills and learned those skills, then they turn around and teach somebody teach else. Somebody else. That's what we I'm hoping today. the same thing is going to happen with these studios. And it doesn't just have to be young people. But the idea is because we are a startup, we don't have infinite amount of resources. I can't just hire a uh, production team of a dozen people right now. Um, we're going to have to rely on some you know, really bright uh, uh, and knowledgeable people that certainly exist here in this community to acquire some of those skills so that they can teach others how to do it. And we'll grow it organically that way. That's one area. Another area is uh, um, when we do, when we start doing some of these after hours events on Friday and Saturday nights, just like in the, in the world of community theater, uh, I think we're going to need a, a staff of house volunteers to provide some hospitality as well so that our staff aren't so overwhelmed when they're planning and executing a, right. a, an event we're going to need some people to greet uh, and welcome um, our patrons when they arrive, help them find the, uh, their seat, um, direct them to, um, uh, you know, where they need to go, answer I'll questions. Volunteer. That you got mine. Send me that, up. That's yeah. certainly something that I think there is a, something we can borrow from the community theater world and implement here that will help us achieve our goal. So we're certainly looking for volunteers to do meaningful work Great. like this. And is the best way for people just to come in and, and find somebody? Is there an email address they should send to? How? I think yeah, where, it's important. Where do we find where we can how volunteer? Do we, how do we how do we volunteer? How do okay, we, the uh, Jennifer Bangser. Um, um, I, I you know. Go on the Westport Library. Go on the Westport Library website. Look for Jennifer Bangs or reach out to her. And of Great. course, you can always con- they can always yeah. contact me. I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, uh, or I, ask I just, us. Yeah. We'll yeah. help you. Right. Yeah. We're yeah. Happy I, I want to make sure they know how to get here because right. I I'm I'm so excited. Yeah, we are definitely what this is going to be and what it is, but not only what it is, but what it's going to be and how we'll be involved in it, and then just keep bringing people into this really special place. Um, so do me, a, you. do me a favor when you guys become rock stars in the podcasting world. Just, re, just remember, <laughs> just remember, 
the Westport Library. <laughs> hey, we would never forget, <laughs> for sure. And on that note, Phil's yeah. got to have some sort of tune. He's been dying to play the cricket, so hit it. Great. Hold on, wait, where are they? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. You know what? That was good, though. Okay, I'm getting very good at this. Very good. Right? Yeah, crowd, uh, the crowd, getting, the crowd, the crowd, the audience. Both getting good. Right. So anyway, so we're for, end uh, this. Yeah, nice we're, we're kind of losing our minds yeah. here a little bit. So for our Lori Cochran Dougal, Bill Harmer, I'm Bill Taby, and this is a seat at the table. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Bye. Music score provided by Andrew Shore from Rock Cottage Studio. Thanks, Andrew.